Okay, <clears throat> we're going to try and give you a four-part, somewhat harmonious uh, presentation today. We'll see whether or not it works in real time, but that's the concept anyway. Um, and my job is simply to begin by suggesting why we started with this uh, project in the first place, we and our colleagues who are not here with us today. Uh, and part of it is to start with the admission that this has been a somewhat difficult year in paradise. And I'm not talking about the kitchen reconstruction, which is one thing, but there's plenty of stuff going on in the world outside of here that has been disruptive for many of the members in terms of thinking about their projects and matching what they would do and so forth. Um, uh, the election was unsettling and much of the political rhetoric around it was unsettling for the values that many of us hold and care about. Um, and events in Turkey, there are a whole set of things going on in different parts of the world. Uh, and then with the first travel ban, which was announced in January, there was a great deal of disconsternation because that seemed to go against everything this place would stand for uh, from the very uh, beginnings. And we had different discussions of what we might do in response. And one of the ideas, one which is, is the motive uh, behind this, and especially a couple of the people sitting uh, with me today were very instrumental in getting this going, was the idea that we would look at the early history of the Institute and try and recall and remember what had been going on at that time and what the response of people at that time had been. Um, so it's important to recall and became much more visible to us once we got going just how unlikely it was this place would have gotten started at that moment. It was a very, very inauspicious moment to start an operation like this. Uh, there was the Depression and then the march up to World War II. It's, it's very unlikely this place would get going, and yet it did. Uh, and <clears throat> both to recognize that and then to think about the kinds of actions that were done and to see as well the advantages that the Institute had, in a sense, by being active at that moment, that it was able to get started as a premier institute in part because there were so many refugee scholars seeking a home at that particular moment, and the Institute acted to provide them with that home. And so we're going to go, and from that's my spiel, is just to try and set the stage. Now we're going to go in order, more or less, and try and give a sense of what it is we've been working on, what we found, and what we hope for this initiative going forward in the future. Right. And so maybe just before starting, I'll just say that the other two members of the group that couldn't join us today are Fadi Bardawi and um, Klaus Oshema. Um, Klaus has officially become a former member. He's actually already left. But, um, but, um, but so, and, and there are many other people that have been sort of contributing to this in informal ways. And the whole idea is really to, has been to set up a, a group that sort of outlives the, the, the constituent members and the people come and go and, and, and fill in um, and as, as the group sort of survives and, and moves forward. So um, I, I gather you've seen the, these articles and you've been sent the link. These are the, the three articles that we, that we wrote. I just want to give you a quick sense of what, um, what we, we, we did as a group. Um, so there was this um, that is now, is now up on the website and, and is in the, the newsletter that is coming out or has just come out in, in, in press. And, and the second thing that we've been working on in earnest of the, of the past few days has been an exhibit that will actually go up next week um, in the corridor leading to the, to the Dilworth room, just in time for the, for the, the, the Board of Trustees meeting, which um, picks up on a lot of the material from the, 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 the newsletter articles, but brings it forward also up, right up until the 1970s, again, sort of taking select moments in the history of the Institute to explore what Peter was just saying about how did people here react to other moments of crisis or of, of tension, um, including much worse ones than, than the one that we're living um, in right now. And so I want to take you back a little bit to, to the 1930s to, 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 to highlight one key point that we found in, in rummaging through the archives. And here, I think Pascal is really the initiator. He's the first one to sort of explore the, 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 the stuff and sort of open up this, this, um, this opportunity um, and, and, and that we all sort of latched onto. Um, and it, it became very clear to us very quickly that in looking at these archives that um, there was a tension right at the heart of the, the, the vocation, the raison d'etre of the, of the Institute as early as the 1930s, um, between, on the one hand, a place that would be this sort of secluded paradise for scholars, sort of um, where we could come and forget the world around us and, and work in splendid isolation and, and bucolic setting, 
um, on, our, on our respective um, projects. And it was obviously very important to the, to the, the foundation of the Institute. But at, at the other hand, right on the other hand, right from the beginning, uh, and sorry, and I, should, I should just say that there's um, a very nice sort of, um, um, uh, um, sort of indication of this in, in some of these telegrams um, that get exchanged. The one on the right here is um, Abraham Flexner writing to Einstein um, while he's at, uh, at sea coming to the United States. And um, I don't have the exact wording, but basically he tells him, whatever you do, don't speak politics when you arrive. In the <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously, and that's a theme that will continue throughout Einstein's stay here um, at the Institute right up until the 1950s and his positions um, um, in, in, in the McCarthy era. Um, so that's, that's on, the, on the one hand, this idea of a bubble, essentially. But at, on the other hand, there was, right from the beginning, this um, feeling that this institute could not be um, um, a, a place isolated, cut off from the world, that it was a product of its time, um, that it needed to engage with its time, and that it also profited to a certain extent, benefited from its time. Einstein would not have come here, most likely, um, had it not been in the 1930s. Um, and, and that's something that, that is the case for, for a number of other people. And so right from the start, you get the sense of the, 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 the attention between Flexner's original vision, um, his concern for, for the, the, the PR to a certain extent of this place and, and of having American scholars, you see it in his, in his letters, we need to take, be careful about the nationalist sentiments, not sort of stoke too many tensions um, here. And Biblin, among others, is sort of pushing him on, saying, no, we need to do more to help these people um, that, that are being persecuted in Europe. By, by 1933, it's, it's very obvious Göttingen is being shut down, essentially, and so um, a lot of mathematicians are, being, um, are looking for a new home. One of them um, um, is Annie Neuter, and, and, and she's one of the, the sort of case studies that we focused on in the articles and in the exhibit here. So Jan is just going to say a few quick words about her. Right, and, just, yeah. just mention of, in a very few words what uh, Eminoto's scientific legacy was, just to give you an idea of how significant uh, a figure she was. So I'm, I'm just going to mention two of her major achievements. The first would be in the field of algebra, of abstract algebra, where she introduced a notion that is now called Noetherian rings, just to give you an idea of how important it's become. It, it took her name. It, it pops up in, in lots of different places in, in modern mathematics. It's a very central notion. <coughs> The, the, the second aspect, which I guess is closer to, to what I do, is, uh, is, um, is in physics, where she has uh, understood a, um, a conceptual and systematic connection between symmetries of nature and conservation laws, which means essentially that if, I, if you, you believe that if I perform an experiment today, I'll have the same answer as if I, I perform that experiment tomorrow, that means that there's an, a quantity called energy that's conserved. That's, and that, that turned out to be extremely important in the developments of, in various, various aspects of the development of, uh, of modern physics, perhaps most notably in, in general relativity and in, in the development of particle physics. That's great. And so Neuter, of course, comes here as a visitor. She gets a position at Bryn Mawr. And unfortunately, she dies prematurely in 1935. But Vivian is, is instrumental in this, this chorus, constant correspondence back and forth with Flexner, who's saying, oh, we, we've got to be careful. We can't, we've already helped these people. We can't do too much. But Vivian is really pushing on. All of this leads by the, by the late 30s, um, at least you know, this is our interpretation from, from the documents, a sort of what we are calling the Flexner's conversion, um, his, his, his sense that um, it, that he came to realize that this place had to be a, a paradise in the world, that it had to engage um, with the world because because the world wouldn't leave it alone, so 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 to say. And so it, 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 I think it shows up really nicely in this in this moment here of 1939, where um, what you see here on the left is is um, um, Flexner's last report um, as a as a director to the board of trustees. Um, where he essentially says that the, the, the center of gravity of world culture and knowledge has shifted inexorably in time from um, ancient Rome, from Greece, all the way to, to Göttingen, and, and, and now is in the United States. Um, but the implication is that it might not always be in the United States looking ahead. Um, and so there's, there's a sense of the transience of these paradises, which is something that we've felt very, very strongly um, um, this 
this, this past year. And it's exactly at that moment that he also becomes a member of the, 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 the Executive Committee of the Emergency Committee in Aid of Displaced Foreign Scholars. Um, Veblen's already part of it, so the ancestor of scholars at risk in, in, in many ways, showing the, the sort of way in which the Institute is intertwined with these organizations. And it's also at that moment, the very moment in 1939, that he writes his famous article, The Usefulness of Useless Knowledge. I'm glad I got it the right way around. <laughs> <laughs> and and, um, and so, so, so I, th I think it's, I mean, we, we really think that it's, it's, it's very difficult to understand that text divorced. I mean, it's very easy to, but, 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 but it's very easy to think of that text as sort of being a celebration of useless knowledge, but, but, but it's also important to contextualize it in its time. Um, as, as, a, as a product of its time and of this realization, what we're, call, what we're calling collectivist conversion. I'm going to sort of go very briefly here through some more of these slides. What we're trying to show with the exhibit and the articles is the continued engagement under successive directors in the 1940s, trying to help a number of other scholars. Again, we sort of picked um, in the archives, there's a ton more work to do. Pascal will say a little bit more about future projects in that respect. Um, Einstein, of course, is at the forefront of all of this. Here you see him in that famous photo with refugee children. Um, at his, uh, which birthday? It's in 1949. Um, um, it's, 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 it's a birthday of his. Um, and, and what we also found are these you know, terrific um, denunciation letters during the McCarthy era of, of, of people writing to the Institute saying, that Einstein of yours, he may be very brilliant, but, but he, I'm sure he's a commie in disguise and he, he, he's very un-American. And so, so again, showing just how much the, the Institute through the decades was, was um, um, a sort of interface um, with, the, with, the, with the, the world around it. And last but not least, we, we brought this up to the 1970s and the work of Albert Hirschman um, the, the, the economist and, and political scientist, who you see here in the 1940s in occupied and, and, sort of, and collaborationist France, helping um, Varian Fry um, smuggle up over 2,000 plus um, um, people from France um, um, at the time. Um, this is only one of the many things that Hirschman did in his extraordinary life. Um, Importantly for us, he, he was instrumental in the founding of the School of Social Science um, at the Institute in the 1970s, together with Clifford Geertz, a very young Joan Scott, who you see here, mm -hmm. pictured in 1985, together with Michael Walzer. Um, and um, and I, for us, in, in a way, that's, that was a sort of apotheosis of the, the Institute in the world, the paradise in the world, engaging with questions of contemporary um, um, social and political um, um, relevance. Um, the documents here illustrate Hirschman's activity helping um, refugee persecuted scholars um, from Latin America, from um, Spain under Franco. Um, so, so again, this is work in progress. It's incomplete. We did this in, in, this, in about 10 days, I think. <laughs> um, there, there are actually mistakes. You can, if you want to spot the mistake here and there, uh, you're welcome to do so. But it's been a lot of fun, um, as, you, as hopefully um, you can tell, um, and, and we hope to sort of set the ball um, rolling and that, that it can sort of you know, keep rolling and other things can, can be done. But Pascal will tell you a little bit about future ideas. Yeah, it? so to conclude, as Thomas was saying, so we were thinking this history working group should be an open structure so that new members can get into it very easily. Nobody feels that it's uh, owned by somebody. And also that former members uh, can continue getting, staying involved with this in some way uh, if they're interested in this, in this project. And so uh, perhaps AMIAS could be a good structure to foster this involvement of, uh, of members. Um, there was some talk of writing maybe one day a small booklet uh, putting together these texts as a kind of a, a new uh, unofficial history of the Institute. Uh, I must say, so I say unofficial because what was very pleasant for us was also to work very fast, informally and collectively on this project. And of course, it would probably also be interesting to have a more scholarly research, but this would take much more time. And here, our idea was that you could also do something reacting real time to the present, using uh, history as a way to imagine new courses of action in the present. And so, of course, specialists of these periods might say it's more complicated, etc. We tried to show also the complexity, and this is not uh, just a, a praise of everything that the Institute faculty did. And uh, there are some, for example, um, in the 30s, uh, welcoming refugees. It's at the same time, there are, there are some members of faculty that are very open, and some others that just want to welcome the elite. And uh, anybody who's under the very, very top elite, uh, they're not interested. 
So there are different ways to judge this, to, to look at this. But there is still, uh, in any case, a lot of work to do. So what we're what I'm thinking, work on individual characters. So we're speaking of Hirschman. Hirschman is a very good biography uh, on Hirschman and a lot of episodes of his life that we haven't uh, written about. Uh, Panofsky is also very active and we didn't write anything about him, even though we had some documents, we had seen some documents. Um, thematic work also. So I thought of two th such themes that really would resonate with the present and would be very interesting. One was the, the Institute and the bomb. As, as you know, uh, well, of course, there's Einstein and Oppenheimer that were in the same hallway at one moment in Fold Hall. Uh, but there was also, after George Kennan, uh, there was Freeman Dyson, uh, who uh, campaigned against uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons, but at the same time was also an advisor to uh, the U.S. Uh, Defense Department on these nuclear issues, etc. Et so it would, there would be something really uh, worth making a kind of complex history of the Institute and the bomb. And the other one is the Institute and Islam. As in the documents we saw, one of the first uh, scholars that they're going to host here in the 30s is uh, Herzfeld, who's um, so British uh, in Iran, a specialist of Assyriology. And this tradition of uh, studies of the Middle East, as you know, uh, has been very active uh, until today in the School of Historical Studies, also in the School of Social Science with Clifford Geertz, the World of Islam, with John Scott, the World of Islam in France, etc. So, uh, we hope that, in any case, in the next few months you can come back and see the exhibit and that this was really only the beginning of a larger project. So, thank you. And I should maybe just add that we, we wish to thank also very much so the archivists, um, Dick Eric and Mosner, without, with, and then Casey, of course, who's here, without, um, without whom we could not have done any of this. And they've been extremely um, helpful. Um, yeah, this, this institution always puts the members in front, but in fact, uh, like most of the great work that was done here was also done by the staff, <laughs> and uh, so really like the knowledge. Maria Suya yeah, for these. Yeah, Maria Suya, yeah, everyone else. She's been working around the clock for three days yeah. to get these together. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, sure we'll is. definitely open it up for yes. questions, but I'd like to abuse my privilege <laughs> and ask the first question, which is just can you talk a little bit about how you ended up in the archives and what was sort of the, the spark for the project, the, 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 the document, the discovery moment when you really felt like this was going to go somewhere? You were the first in the archives. Yeah, yeah. Well, so, so I guess it's geographical because I, I don't work in an office, I work in the library. Ah. <laughs> so, the archives were not very far. I had never had an occasion to go there, really, a pretext. And um, and um, at one moment, I started looking on the website. Uh, I saw a letter quoting another letter by Einstein. I went to see uh, uh, Casey and Erica. I asked them, do you have that letter that is by, by Einstein? And then started looking into that. And it was so easy, because uh, a lot of the collections are digitized. And, uh, and this is, uh, I've always been interested in the, like, this kind of history work, like that a bit informal, and uh, I had read a book on the history of the institute before coming uh, to the institute to know a bit where, where I was in foot, <laughs> and, but with nothing on these uh, topics. So. And so within the context of what Peter was describing of us feeling we've got to do something, we can't just sort of sit here in splendid, obscene isolation and let the world fall apart around us. This seemed like something. Well, we know how to do this. We we, we can do this. Um, so so it seemed like a worthwhile thing. Of course, my second book has gone down the drain. It was also a, <laughs> uh, it was a splendid excuse not to do the work. <laughs> but we will write a good report. Then. I always say that I hope that people fail in their projects and do something much better. But this must be kind of a, a kind of very exotic uh, version of that argument. Paul, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so you've done this fabulous work, and you've constructed a narrative, and you have ambitions for having it carry on. But as it is, it's immensely powerful already, right? Mm -hmm. And you're going to be showing it here at the Institute, but uh, it's so neat that it seems like there might be an opportunity for it to be more widely appreciated. Uh, I don't know if you have plans to uh, put even this uh, original documentation up. On our website, it occurred to me, though, as I saw this, that uh, back in the centennial of Einstein's birthday in 
1979, uh, that a, an exhibit just like this of original documentation was put up at the National Museum of American History. And I should think that that museum would be quite interested in knowing what you're doing and might take this as a traveling exhibit or mm -hmm. some project one ever be. And I could introduce you to some of the people at Smithsonian where it used to be. So that, that was the thing that just struck me. Keep, and, and then the other was your comment about kind of doing this quickly and in real time reminded me that um, I run an organization called Climate Central, which is trying to do real-time analysis of extreme weather events, uh, attribution of those to climate change. And sometimes you can do this now, which is extraordinary, sometimes you can't. But the main point is that you get a group of scientists together to work collaboratively using multiple methods and do it as fast as you can when people are interested in understanding whether an extreme event is actually attributable to the presence of greenhouse gases. So what you're doing is almost virtually analogous to this, right? Mm -hmm. It's real-time analysis of something that is an extreme event, that's what we're looking at, using historical methodologies. It's really, really exciting. And so I think there's just a great narrative of why this is such a, a breakthrough thing that you could develop uh, over time. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> my, my comment's going to be almost a pale echo of Paul's, but I felt fortunate that I didn't read Linda's email, which may have come after I got the online version of the newsletter. I immediately went to your three articles, mm -hmm. and I stayed up till, well, after 2 a.m. reading I mean, slowly but carefully. And when I read the Desert article, there, there was a poignancy in recognizing that things are happening a little bit too slowly. It's like watching you know, a parent pass away. You can't quite get on top of it. So this is now coming back to the rules of publications, that I think being on top of it in real time, it, it's, it, the document itself sort of shows the, 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 the frustration in not being able to do things quickly enough. Yeah. You know, sort of, so, so I hope you know, there have been, I don't know, I'm thinking mathematics, Terry Tao has a very popular and current blog and many other of these people in you know, the science science and I'm sure have had an you know, outside of the science that everybody had it. But this would be a, a very high level type of a, 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 a blog to have which is exactly these are great suggestions and, and, and we should mention probably Kelly uh, Tom Devine Thomas Devine yeah, yeah, Thomas yeah, Thomas yeah, Thomas yeah. newsletter editor who who basically commissioned these yeah, and who had done a lot of uh, her own her research own on this, which we used, uh, which was very, I mean, she had found a lot of things. So, so this could be just the beginning, and, and I'm definitely, we're, I think, mean, all we're interested in exploring other venues. And again, setting the example for other people when we leave this valley of tears. Yes, Claudia. Uh, thank you so much. This is fantastic. And I want to, I want to uh, echo what has already been said. And just mention I have a comment and then a question. But my comment is that when I came here, it was a long time ago, and uh, I'm in art history. So Panofsky actually is of great interest to me for reasons I'd love to talk to you about. Um, and Panofsky and the war, actually, uh, and his roots in Hamburg. And, but um, when I came here, I learned really for the first time here talking to physicists about the different uh, temporalities of scholarly publication. To me, it was entirely new. You know, I mean, I live in a world of peer-reviewed, I still do, fundamentally, peer-reviewed articles and books, and there were physicists here. Matt, what's his name? Matt, Tegmark? Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Right, was yeah. the one who Max. said to Max. me, Max, that's it, yeah. who said to me, what? You wait how many months? <laughs> 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 you just publish it you know, the next morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I've always, I mean, this seems to me like one of those, uh, uh, as astonishingly ripe for a historical project for real-time publication. And so, um, it just for me, makes a kind of perfect circle back to wondering, you know, like how in, in historical studies could we approximate that kind of temporality. So that's uh, astonishing and wonderful, and I hope you will involve other people in, you know, moving forward um, uh, if you publish it, for example, online or, you know, something like that. Um, my question is, um, I, I'm genuinely curious, where are the women in your group? 
far in the... <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. It's very legitimate. I don't mean it critically. I just. Um... Karen, Karen was she very helpful with the Noether article. Yeah, Noether, of course. Right. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, and John Rowe. I was going to say that that's a question we were asking the entire time. Uh, and there were. Lori Allen is a, is a member who's um, basically with him. The larger, this is probably a larger group of, let's say, 20 people who were militants, if we could use that word, um, in January. And very quickly, we found different locations, so to say. And so another member, Lori Allen, who's in the School of Social Science, has been is preparing another project that is connected in, 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 in many ways to this. And I won't say any more because it, it is being kept somewhat under wraps. And I don't, I don't know actually what. Um, um, Céline Bessière has, has chipped in, um, uh, Muriel has chipped in. I mean, the, the, it, it's, it, it does look a little bit so stereotypical that four white men come up and, and, and talk um, and to you about this, and, and we are conscious of, about that. It's something we would definitely not want to reproduce. It was not intended to be that way. No, and we were kind of conscious of it the whole time. The whole time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so, yeah. These are the first three articles. I, I mean, I really think that there is something of a coincidence. There's one thing which is not a coincidence is that uh, the meetings that we had to prepare the exhibit, prepare the newsletter, etc. Uh, so the, ten, the faculty, the staff of the institute that we work with tend to be female. And so we're male. And then there's on top of it this idea that the staff should uh, like face themselves and let the members take all paternity. <laughs> not paternity. <laughs> for the articles, it felt quite very awkward at times because uh, uh, we're not—I mean, we're not used to this, uh, and we are. Uh, hope we're not. None of us are used to this, and and so. So we, we've insisted yeah. actually on the exhibit. I, I haven't showed you the the the, the, the first the opening opening panel of the exhibit, but the only people who are singled out are Erica Mosner and, and uh, Maria Tuya. Without They're the ones who did and all the real work, I mean, without which it would not be an exhibit. Right, and so, so I, yeah. point taken, yeah. it's it's not intentional, and and it, it, it won't be that way. Uh, so maybe going, going forward. forward, it could be a member staff initially. That we would very much, I mean, it, yeah, very much like it. we 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 were for that, but I mean, yeah. I think it's also it's normal that I mean, staff they're employed here, and so they don't know exactly. Uh, there is an institutional should they or, yeah. Uh, this is part of why we want it to be the history working group right. as a collective author rather than designating individual roles and have it be an expansive collectivity that people are invited to join in to the level of their capacity at any given moment. You're also just looking at the people who happen to either have the time or made the time or for whatever reason wanted to get away from doing something else. <laughs> and, 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 and we, this is what we did. And the way when we the meeting where we decided for these three articles, for example, like what are the three first articles going to be? So we were around the table one evening, and we just said, okay, well, we'll do this, we'll do that, you do that, and it was really completely arbitrary because nobody was a specialist of anything special, uh, except Jan. Who except knew, Jan is the only one who knows. We knew how to understand what Emil Noether says <laughs> <laughs> and to explain it also, which was a that was great. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, fantastic. But uh, but so that's why but we, we had this collective sure. authorship after. Because uh, there's no reason. I mean, and everybody reread everything. And uh, like Peter Goddard, he reread everything yeah. that we wrote like five times, and he was fact checking everything. Yeah. And saying, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was very very useful. But then at the end, he said, "Oh no, I don't want to be cited as an author." And so it saved us from many mistakes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's terrific if I can say something. We, 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 because this year particularly, we're thinking about you know what are there some ways to kind of support member-driven events. And you start, before you know, you start thinking about this top down. You know? This would be nice if this event happens spontaneous. <laughs> and, and, and of course, this is the perfect example of something that nobody of us was planning for. But I think where we have a flexibility at the Institute, and I must say, it's very nice of you to uh, say so, speak so warmly about the staff, because I think they are incredibly dedicated and willing to go on these kind of uh, new, new directions. So it's, that, that actually, I think, is terrific. And I must say it's also great to see this kind of usefulness of our useless history. Yeah. And, and, and I often <laughs> make the point, I think the first real war effort uh, at the Institute was actually the history group mm -hmm. uh, that uh, was studying uh, uh, 
battles lost by the Germans. I think that's. <laughs> 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 uh, and uh, so it's that that in some sense not only the sciences or something that played a role. I think that that's kind of a very nice interplay. Well, one concern for us is is really obviously how how does this survive as a as a group as a sort of shell look going forward. Um, we would like for this not to just die out, and, and obviously there is a risk because we'll go back to our lives. And it's good to see that you all survive, you all survive, but we don't know. Survival. 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 Well, these are the only ones. That's what happens. It's all about the survivors. So, so we, we, I mean, if you have ideas, We'd love to know how you kept in touch, how what what sort of platforms, what I mean, what, what kind of infrastructure you, you would you might have ideas about setting up so that this doesn't just disappear because there is so much more to be done and it's addictive. Well, and I don't think you have to be a historian to sort of find this um, um, so addictive. Um, and, and it's also useful. I, I think um, Robert, you're right that there, it's a useless history as so long as it stays. Here in, in the archives, but it actually has a, a usefulness and a potential impact. So, so we, we're, we're really hopeful that next year, some um, well, the current political situation will last longer, right? So, so, so hopefully next year there will be a same sort of impetus, and, and we're willing to continue communicating and, 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 and sort of helping the new members come who come fill in. The, 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 the sort of slots and, 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 and sort of guide them to, to a certain extent so that they can keep this, this going. But um, if there's any sort of way in which we can, well, we're all going to become MS members and, 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 and vice versa, what, what, what you have to suggest, then it would be great to hear that. So maybe informally or not necessarily now. Implicit non existent is a way. I was really drawn in without any prompting to this. It's a, okay. it's a way to provide feedback. A blog is just one. Sure. It's maybe not a good one, but, but someone usually owns a blog, but it could be an own collective. I don't know if it is a collective one. Mm -hmm. But that would be a way to engage people who aren't in the room, aren't mm -hmm. anywhere, right. other than somewhere on the planet. Mm -hmm. Not even on the planet? Not even on the planet. We're ambitious. We're ambitious. We're ambitious. The paradise in and out of the world. Are there any members of the Gang of Twenty who will be here next year from natural yeah. sciences or not? So we don't and others. Because it, the one one can imagine from the you know the positive response in the room, obviously it would be terrific for Omni, also it would be terrific for the institute to keep this kind of highlighted for all of the pressing reasons of the present. But at the same time, of course, what makes it work and what makes it especially um, moving to see is that it's done by current members. And I I can easily imagine, you know, we all come with this great sense of, of wanting to use our time as much as possible when you come to a, a wide open space like, like this. But I can also easily imagine that if there were a working group already in place, a few people who were existing members who would have been here last year as of September to use that as an appeal to new members coming in, I, I think that would be really central. I think central. one idea is, well, yeah, obviously it's going to be here next year and, and, and to bring one or two people back in yeah. September to, to, at orientation or whatever it is to, to sort of... It would be great to, to, I think, I mean, the least we could do is if some of you come back and give a presentation right. or something and that you know, would be a good way for people to orient themselves and, and then sign up uh, right. in any shape or way that they want. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm just curious. All right, well, will you please join me in thanking...